to ask them. The purpose of the session today is to have a discussion on hearings and appeals to help you prepare if you get asked to, to sit on either of those. Uh, meetings may be held for a, a number of reasons, uh, for either disciplinary, it could be a grievance that's been raised, redundancy process, you might be going through a, a capability uh, process in relation to the performance of a particular employee or in relation to an employee's uh, sickness, either long-term sickness absence or uh, the number of their sickness absences. Um, but today, because of the limit of, on our time, we're going to just focus on grievance and disciplinary cases. The key thing to be aware of right at the outset is the ACAS code of practice. We will discuss the importance of getting the processes right later on, but the key point here to be aware of is that if a claim is made to a tribunal, first of all, having followed the ACAS code of practice will help you to defend that claim, and also the tribunal can award an uplift of up to 25% uh, to any compensation that's awarded for an employer's failure to follow the ACAS code. So in terms of disciplinaries, uh, the overall process according to ACAS is to establish the facts of the case, so carry out an investigation, inform the employee of the problem, hold a meeting to discuss it, so that's the hearing, give the employee the right to be accompanied, decide on the appropriate action and give that employee uh, the right of appeal. In terms of the grievance procedure, uh, once you've received the grievance, then you have to establish the facts of the case uh, to carry out an investigation. It may be that you need to meet with the employee that's raised a grievance as part of that in investigation, um, but then certainly you would then need to hold a meeting to discuss the grievance, which is the hearing. It may well be that becomes two meetings, or it might be that, that the hearing is the only meeting you need to have with that employee, depending on the circumstances. Um, again, give the employee the rights to be accompanied to the grievance hearing, decide on the appropriate action, and give the employee the right of appeal. The essential issues um, to consider for any of these kinds of meetings is that in particular matters should not be unduly delayed by any party. Um, you can often see repeated requests to delay the date of the meeting for a variety of reasons. That could be the availability of the employee, the availability of their union representative, uh, the employee's illness, for example, and you should consider these requests. But if, for example, no full reason has been given or if there's um, repeated requests for delay because of the unavailability of a union representative, for example, then you should consider whether or not it is actually reasonable to delay that hearing again. Um, equally, if it's the school that's looking to delay the hearing, is there a good reason for doing so? Is it because of the availability of witnesses that, that are attend intending to be um, at that hearing? The Hearings are not intended to be adversarial and they're not legal proceedings. Um, it's predominantly about establishing the facts. So in a disciplinary, did the person do what they were alleged to have done? Um, it's, it's not necessarily seeking to persuade the panel or, or the chair one way or another. Um, it's just about finding out what actually happened on the balance of probabilities. Um, in terms of cross-examination of witnesses, um, the employee should be given a reasonable opportunity to ask questions, present evidence and call re relevant witnesses. But again, the purpose is to establish the facts. It's not to, to catch people out and certainly not cross-examination in the style that you might have seen in courtroom dramas, for example. Um, another issue that we have had uh, raised is evidence and whether or not evidence is admissible in um, a, a hearing setting. Um, again, it's not subject to the same tests as legal proceedings and certainly not um, in respect of, of criminal proceedings. So for example, the admissibility of hearsay evidence, um, the panel or if it's deciding alone, the, the individual simply has to decide which evidence um, on balance they prefer and weigh the evidence accordingly. So if there is something that um, comes up that is hearsay or it, it's been passed through a number of different people before it's reached the, the investigation and the investigator, um, then you weigh that evidence accordingly if you've not been able to actually verify it from the source. It's not that it's inadmissible in itself. Um, <clears throat> the essential first steps to consider if you're asked to be a chair or be on the panel for a hearing. Um, you should be familiar with the relevant policy and or procedure um, for 
your school, your academy, um, because the processes will be different in different organisations. Um, although you would expect them to follow broadly the principles from the ACAS code, there will be nuances that apply um, that are particular to that school or that academy. Um, and so make sure you're familiar with that. Also understand what you're being asked to do in your role at a hearing or an appeal and think of the kind of questions you might want to ask as part of that hearing. The person chairing the hearing will be responsible for managing it uh, and it might be that there are some difficult conversations to be had. Uh, it, it might well be stressful for the employees involved. Emotions might be running high. Um, at this stage, we're going to do a quick poll. Um, let me launch the poll now. So you are chairing a hearing and the employee starts to cry. Do you ignore them and ask the parties to proceed? Do you offer an adjournment or do you say to the employee that they should pull themselves together? We'll give you a few moments just to cast your votes on that one. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, we've had a unanimous um, results that you should offer an adjournment and you're quite right that would be the, the most appropriate uh, uh, source of action. The um, reason we put it, it does seem quite obvious on the face of it when we're sitting here in a training session today but um, if you've not been in a hearing before where that situation has arisen then um, it can sometimes catch you off guard um, and so it, it's uh, useful to remember that actually you can offer an adjournment for them to uh, gather their thoughts. Um, it's important to remain objective and calm at all times and, and seek to diffuse the situation if required. Um, so yes, if, if you've not had that situation come up before, it can be quite daunting, but um, it's quite, quite proper to be um, offering an adjournment. And you should also consider, are there any um, adjustments that you need to be making to the process? Go on to look at grievance meetings now and Eleanor will cover this for you. Okay, sorry. Okay, so what's really important is that with any grievance situation is to see if you can try and deal with it informally first and obviously um, that's something that ACAS recommend that you do and it re is really helpful to see whether you can, a line manager can speak to their employee so that see if things can be um, nipped in the bud at an early stage. However, that's not always possible and sometimes it could, it's, it, it may have been dealt with informally at first but it's, it's not resolved the matter or it, the matter is so seriously it needs to go to uh, the formal stage in which case um, then you will have to set up a meeting um, with the aggrieved person. Now, what's really important here is that, um, you know, you need to look at your policy and consider the nature of the grievance as to how you deal with it. Sometimes there may, need, there may be a need for the investigation to happen or some form of investigation to happen before you meet with the employee. Um, often it can be a meeting with the employee and that you might need to do some investigations after. Often in schools, depending on the complexity of the, the um, the grievance and whether there's lots of witnesses to see um, then somebody will investigate the matter and then present findings at some sort of grievance meeting there's no hard and fast rules it will depend on the nature of it so you'll just need to think about and um, how the matter will be dealt with uh, depending on the, the, the circumstances of your your case um, so there will need to be a meeting with the aggrieved person um, and the manager or panel and it will depend on what you do in your um, what your policy as to who hears grievance so what happens at the meeting? Um, well, the, the priority of your meeting, because it is the employee's process, is for the employee to explain their grievance and how they think it should be resolved. And remember, it's only what they think um, that it should, how it should be resolved. Um, as I say, investigation is important in a grievance situation. It may be you need to adjourn the investigation to do some sort of investigation, to find out what's happened, to look at some emails, et cetera, et cetera. That's perfectly reasonable. As part of the investigation process, think about what's been said. Um, don't make any snap decisions. So don't make a decision there and then after meeting the employee. You may have to consider it, may need to speak to other people. But certainly in the meeting, you might want to sum up the points. And certainly if the grievance involves a number of different issues, you may, for your own good, want to actually sum up and sort of um, summarise back to the employee what's been said. Um, at some stage, you will need to tell the employee um, at the end of the meeting when, when they'll 
they'll expect to get the outcome. And this usually is written in your policy. So check the policy as to how long you have to respond to the grievance and make sure you stick to, stick to that. I think the priority for any grievance is to have that discussion with a view to um, leading to a solution we probably all know that grievances are very, very difficult situations. The person that's, ag that's aggrieved is very unhappy. And if it's about an in another individual, they're very unhappy as well. So it is about trying to see if there's an, any sort of form of resolution you could do or any, any action that you could do to make things better. So what happens at the meeting? Well, the, the priority is to listen to the employee, ask them to explain their grievance. They may have already set it out in a letter, but this is their opportunity to really set it out uh, in more detail. And again, as I said before, how they want it to be resolved. Consider the information that you've got and or through the investigation. Or if there hasn't been an investigation, you might want to adjourn it for that investigation to, to take place. As I say, summarise what's been said and then check any facts as necessary. It could be that you go, go away and check some emails. Sometimes an employee might say they've not had any support from their line manager and you can check some emails. There may be some um, sort of documentary evidence that you can, you can call upon in terms of support. So what happens after the meeting? Well, it's really important that when you've got all this information and there can be lots and lots of information that you reflect and consider what you've got, look at the evidence, look at what you've got and start to sort of break down and, and, and look at the particular issues. But make, make a decision based on your judgment of the circumstances. It's a, not an exact science. So it really is based on your judgment and what you've actually um, been presented to you. The decisions you may, may make will be either to uphold the grievance to, you know, to say yes, that, you know, I accept your grievance and what you've said to me or you might partially uphold it so there may be elements of the grievance that you can accept but others that you don't or you may be rejecting the grievance in in totality um, and that's you know that's based on your judgment you then need to set out in writing the decision of the time scales that will be set out in your policy and it's very important that you do that you might in part of your decision actually recommend some a form of action and it could be and I think as Emily said it could be um, it, it could be that you recommend some sort of disciplinary action Action. So you move from your grievance policy to your disciplinary policy. But again, you'd need to work out exactly, you know, how you move from that. But that might be one of the recommendations you make as part of this grievance process. And then obviously offer a right of appeal. Obviously, if you've upheld the grievance, then the, um, the, 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 the requirement to appeal is, is obviously um, is, is not there. But obviously, if you've partially upheld or rejected the grievance, then they should have a right of appeal against your decision. And that will go to um, somebody somebody else probably somebody impartial that's not been involved and usually more senior person could even go to a panel okay so now I'm going to talk about disciplinary hearings so you may be asked to attend a hearing as either the, the sole decision maker or as part of a wider panel and that will tend so uh, de depend on your particular policy so check your policy as to who hears cases um, and it will it, it's it's quite interesting that there, there should be you should have an, in your organization a schema delegation about who can conduct um, hearings and on what level of sanction and um, for example um, it may well be that you have um, an individual hearing um, allegations that of misconduct but where there's potentially a dismissal at the end of it um, that might need to go to, to a panel so make sure that you are the right person to uh, to be involved in in the procedure um, the format uh, for the hearing Okay, um, if you're the chair, you are responsible, responsible for the conduct of the hearing and you'll need to make introductions and explain the purpose of the hearing. What I suggest is that you ask everyone to introduce themselves and explain their role and then you can explain the purpose of the hearing. And the purpose of the hearing is usually to, to hear allegations of misconduct against a particular employee. You then need to confirm arrangements for the employee being accompanied um, and that's they'll be accompanied by either the trade union rep or um, a work colleague. If they're not accompanied and they've chosen not to be accompanied, then for the record, I would always recommend that you put that you, you confirm at the meeting that they're happy to proceed without being accompanied and that that is reflected in the minutes of, um, of the meeting. Um, then go through the format. You should have an agenda for the meeting, print it out, make it available, um, go through the format and then obviously um, offer adjournments as required. Um, we, we had the poll before about uh, an individual crying during a, during a, a meeting. 
that often you know things do happen in, in hearings especially disciplinary hearings so it may be that you do need adjustments particularly if people get upset so don't be afraid to offer those during during that and you as the chair you can do that the format for the hearing will be set out in your agenda and it's basically the management case will be explained first and they'll go through the evidence so this can either be done by the investigating officer reading through their report if there's an investigation report or a summary of that report um, this is the usual format in schools and academies where there will be the investigating officer actually attends the hearing uh, questions can be asked by the employee or the representative of the investigating officer and then by the panel or the chair. Um, the employee then sets out their case um, and basically answers the allegations put in front of them and then the investigating officer um, and, or the hearing officer panel can then ask questions. Um, so the employee should be able to ask questions, present their uh, evidence and call witnesses. There may be witnesses on from both the management side and the employee side. Usually in most cases, most and hearings uh, witnesses don't attend usually it's when there's a conflict in the evidence when there's a conflicting view um, but obviously an employee should be asked to um, should be given the opportunity to have witnesses there they should be relevant witnesses um, you know some of them sometimes they ask for uh, character witnesses but they should be relevant for for the actual hearing so what is expected of you um, so make sure you have read the information beforehand. I know it goes without saying, but make sure you're prepared. In all these things, pre preparation is the, is the most essential thing. You will most likely be sent a disciplinary pack a few days in advance, so make sure you look at that. And there'll be, um, there could be a report and a number of appendices, um, so sometimes the packs can be quite large. Uh, there'll also be probably a submission from the employee. Usually an employee is asked to submit this in advance, um, or they may just read something out at the actual hearing. What's really, really important in your role um, on the panel is to be objective and impartial. This is quite difficult sometimes when you know the individuals, but as long as you shouldn't have necessarily been involved in the, the case. Um, so you just need to be um, as impartial as possible and, and put that put any previous knowledge to one side. Um, what's really important is that you as the chair or, or, or the, the hearing officer gives the employee the opportunity to state their case and answer the allegations. Now, I think we've got a poll coming up, which I think um, Emily is gonna launch for me. Should be launched now. So what can't a companion do in the hearing? Put the employee's case forward, confer with the employee during the hearing or answer questions on the employee's behalf. Let's give you a few moments to cast your votes on the poll. Okay, so we've got a, a um, majority saying that that the companion cannot answer questions on the employee's behalf with a few people also uh, saying that they cannot put the employee's case forward. Yeah, so that's great. Thank you. I, it's because I couldn't see the poll before. So that's why we've done it in a, a shift basis. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so the, the, the correct answer is that um, the, um, the companion can't answer questions on the employee's behalf. Um, they can um, put the, the employee's case forward and very often um, the rep will probably read out a statement in advance. Um, and obviously during the, um, during the hearing, yes, you've all said that they can confer. So it's just um, answering questions on the employee's behalf that's not, not permitted. And as a chair, or as the um, as the hearing officer you may have to control that and often um, that's what you have to do the other thing you might have to control is where the rep or the employee um, makes statements during um, dur when they should be asking questions so you may have to say well what's the question you want to ask the other side uh, sometimes the investigating officer does the same so just make, make sure that you control that as well So the other thing you need to do as a, as, a, as a chair or as a hearing officer is consider the investigation. Now you won't have done the investigation, but it's important that you consider this because this will go to the fairness of the process. You need to consider, was it reasonable and proportionate? Was the investigation reasonable and proportionate? 
that will depend on the nature of the allegations. Obviously, if it's a case of gross misconduct where the potential outcome is a dismissal, then you would expect that that would the investigation would reflect um, that the seriousness the seriousness of the allegations. So you know you need to be satisfied that actually they did go into the information um, and did 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 speak to the appropriate people or look at the evidence because you need to um, consider that as part of your outcome. Remember, you're not investigating the matter, but you are making the decision, but it is important that you reflect on that because it could be that you make the decision that actually they do need further investigation. That does need to happen. So just bear that in mind that you will have to consider um, what investigation that they did because investigating, establishing the facts is an important part of the process. So you'll be considering the facts as part of your role. Um, you need to look at the allegation before you. So does the evidence that's been presented support or go against the allegation? It's a pretty, pretty um, reasonable thing for you to, to consider. On the balance of probability, um, is it more likely than not to have happened in the way described? So that's the, that's the level that you need to consider. It's not beyond reasonable doubt. So on the balance of probability, um, need to consider that. And often you might reflect that in an outcome letter to say, well, actually on the balance of probability, I found X, Y, and Z. Um, you also need to consider the employee's response and the evidence that they presented. What did the employee say during the process? Do have they provided a reasonable explanation of what happened or that what they did? And um, what's their mitigation? Mitigation is very important when you look at this in a round. You know, what, you know, have there been issues outside the home? Are they, are they unwell? Have they got a condition that might have impacted on behaviour? Um, what, are, what are the things that they've brought forward? Are they, are they very um, contrite? Are they very sorry? Have they apologised? Do they accept? Um, do they understand what they've, you know, do they take responsibility? These sort of things you consider. If new facts emerge during the hearing that hasn't been part of the investigation, at that point, you might have to adjourn the meeting. And don't be afraid to do that just because you want to get the hearing done. The, the important thing is to get to the right outcome. And it may be that you have to uh, adjourn and uh, look at those facts, investigate those facts further. So closing the meeting. It's very important that you allow the employee and the, and the investigating officer to sum up their, their case. Usually an investigating officer goes first to sum up their case. It's basically a very short summary. It's not new evidence. It's just a, just a summary of the case. Um, and um, what I would always recommend that you do is ask the employee if they've had the opportunity to state their case. So have they said everything they wanted to say? Hopefully they'll say they have, and then make sure that's reflected in the notes. Very often in an appeal, they might raise that and you can actually, that they haven't been given the opportunity and you might, you might want to be able to say in an appeal, well, actually they did say they had. And then you adjourn the meeting to make the decision. So determining the outcome. We, what we've done here is we've looked at gross misconduct case. Okay, so these are acts that are so serious that they may call for dismissal without notice, even for the first offence. So those cases, so those acts of misconduct that are very, very serious. So it's important in your decision making to, to, to consider, has the case for gross misconduct been made? And in order to do that, look at the examples of the disciplinary rules in your of gross misconduct in your disciplinary policy. So in your policy, they'll, there usually is a list of um, misconduct rules and gross misconduct rules. So have a look at that and see whether it links to that. Uh, for teachers, you may also want to look at um, the teacher standards and, and any breaches of those. The other thing to think to consider is um, whether um, what's happened in similar cases, similar acts of misconduct and what decisions have been made prior, previously. Now, even though you, you judge each case on, the, on its merits and the particular circumstances of a particular case, it's also very important to have a consistent approach. So you wouldn't want to go completely the wrong direction if other cases have been uh, have gone down a different route. The other thing to look at is the employee's disciplinary record. This is also very important. Have they got a previous unblemished record? And what was their mitigation? And should that um, lead to a reduced sanction? And the other thing to say, which obviously is ultimately for an employment tribunal to consider, is was the decision that you made within the range of reasonable responses? So is the penalty reasonable in all circumstances? So that's the thing you need to consider. We're going to move on now to look at appeals. Um, we're going to 
look at appeals whether regardless of whether you're uh, going down the grievance procedure or the disciplinary procedure because um, a, a lot of the principles are the same um, and it is essential part of natural justice to hold an appeal as well as being a requirement under the ACAS code. Um, appeals may be because the employee says there's been a problem with the investigation and the original hearing. It may be that the that new evidence has come to light that might change the outcome. The employee may disagree with the outcome um, for a variety of different reasons and in particular in relation to disciplinary hearings they may say that the uh, sanction that has been decided upon is too severe. So what should you consider when you're looking at an appeal? Um, first of all, have a look at the employee's grounds of appeal. Have those grounds of appeal been made out? Um, you should also have a look at your policy and see how that addresses appeals. And the, the points to consider really are, um, are you going to have a review hearing or a full rehearing? And the difference is that a, a review is looking at the outcome and, and reviewing that decision that was made, taking into account the grounds of appeal. The rehearing is listening to all the evidence again, addressing the concerns that were raised in the grounds of appeal and coming to a fresh conclusion. So essentially hearing it as if it were the first time it's being heard. Um, the conclusion may well be the same as the original conclusion, but it's taking a whole fresh look at it. Um, but it is important to check your policy to see whether or not it allows for both. In terms of the appeal process, um, you should be holding the meeting. That meeting should be chaired by a different person or panel um, than was made the decision in the original hearing. Um, once that has been held, you write to the employee with the outcome and you confirm that that is the final stage of the procedure. But of course, do check that under your policy. It is actually the final stage of the procedure. I have seen some uh, school policies where there's more than one appeal stage. So just make sure you're comfortable with the number of appeals that are allowed under your policy or procedure. Um, and obviously, by the time you get to the final appeal, then, then confirm that is the final stage. Um, ordinarily, with an appeal, on a disciplinary matter you wouldn't expect that to result in an increased sanction or an increased penalty um, it may well be that the original penalty is upheld or it may even be reduced depending on um, whether or not you uphold the appeal um, but you wouldn't ordinarily expect even if you're having a full rehearing that the penalty would be increased and why is it important to get it right uh, there are a number of different claims that an employee could bring um, if they think that the process hasn't been followed properly. Um, if the disciplinary procedure has led to their dismissal, whether it's um, after a final written warning or as a gross misconduct summary dismissal, uh, they could claim that their dismissal is unfair. And part of that test is whether or not a fair procedure has been followed, as well as whether or not it was um, as Ellen has already said, whether the decision to dismiss was within the range of reasonable responses that an employer could take in those circumstances. Um, if they feel that the procedure hasn't been followed properly or that they, particularly if they're not happy with the outcome, they may consider that their um, employment contract has been breached, enabling them to resign and then claim constructive dismissal. Or they may say that something within the procedure has been um, applied in a discriminatory way. Uh, we've already discussed the ACAS uplift, um, the increase of up to 25% on a compensatory award if the ACAS code has not been followed. Um, and in terms of unfair dismissal claims as well, it's just, just uh, worth noting that employment tribunals will consider the size and resources of the employer uh, so, for example, if you would normally have a panel that would hear the appeal, but there aren't enough people available of the right level of seniority who aren't involved in the subject matter, and therefore you decide actually we can only really have one person hearing that appeal, uh, that would be taken into account by an employment tribunal. Um, in terms of last steps, make sure that you keep records of the nature of the issue, what was decided and any actions that were taken. For example, with a grievance, um, did you then start a disciplinary procedure against any of the employees against whom the grievance related um, and also the details of any appeal, uh, but also just bear in mind that records should be kept confidential in accordance with the Data Protection Act. Obviously at the moment we are in a particularly um, unusual situation with the uh, lockdown and the pandemic, although I appreciate that some of you may um, have a bit more access to your workplaces than you have done previously. Um, although that might not always be the case. 
Uh, certainly in terms of grievances, it's likely that you would be able to continue to deal with them remotely. Uh, misconduct hearings and appeals, you can continue those, uh, but it's more likely you'll get pushback from unions, for example. Um, although it is likely that a union would agree to appeal being held against the dismissal because it would be in the members best interests to get that dealt with as soon as possible. It's worth bearing in mind that ACAS has also produced guidance for the current situation that's available on their website um, for you to have a look at if you are looking at procedures at the moment. The particular considerations to bear in mind are up on the screen in the current situation. Um, and ultimately, the employee needs to decide whether or not it would still be fair and reasonable to either carry on with or start a disciplinary or, or grievance procedure, um, taking these things into account. So I'm going to do another quick poll here. So can you ask a furloughed worker to attend a hearing whilst they're not in work? Yes, yes, but only if they agree to attend or no. Thank you to everybody that's voted. Uh, the majority of you have, have said yes with a very narrow um, lead. The, the um, other 45% kind of, of you have said yes, but only if they agree with a few of you, with one of you saying, actually, no, you don't think they can attend. According to the ACAS guidance, someone who is on furlough, and I appreciate that might not be many of your staff, but just it's worth bearing in mind um, that, that someone who's on furlough can take part in a disciplinary or grievance investigation or hearing, um, as long as they're doing it out of their own choice, so it's voluntary, so they, they would have to agree to attend, um, and providing it takes place in line with the current public health guidance, particularly in relation to social distancing. Um, and so they, they can take part if they are under investigation in a disciplinary procedure, if they have raised a grievance, if they're chairing a disciplinary or grievance hearing, if they're taking notes at a hearing or during an investigation interview, if they're being interviewed as part of an investigation, if they're a witness at a hearing, or if they're um, the employee's companion for a hearing. So those are the circumstances in which someone who's on furlough can take part in a disciplinary or grievance investigation. When looking at whether or not the disciplinary or grievance hearing can go ahead, uh, you have to think about if the workplace is open, um, can the procedure continue in line with public health guidelines? So looking into um, social distancing, um, what access is there to rooms um, while the schools are open? The employee will still have a right to be accompanied in the same way they were before. So again, that's something to take into account in relation to social distancing. Um, there's still a duty to make reasonable adjustments. Um, if you're going to be looking at doing things remotely, does everybody have access to the necessary equipment? Do they have internet connection? If you want to be doing um, video conferences, do they have access to a laptop, for example, with video conferencing facilities? Um, will everybody be able to see the relevant documents and the statements that are going to be used? Can the evidence be fairly assessed and questioned if interviews are taking place by a video call, for example? Um, and is there any hard copy evidence that's not accessible remotely? Okay, so that ends our session today. Just wanted to let you know about the next one, which is um, uh, about li links to this one. It's about employment tribunals um, and your approach. So that's on the 9th of June if you want to join that. Um, we've just got time for some questions. I think there was one question somewhere. Uh, the question is, should someone's line manager be able to view their el electronic grievance and or disciplinary record, regardless of whether they were involved in the case? Okay, well, I think probably there's a difference between grievances and disciplinary records here, I would imagine. It may well be that the employee, the line manager may may know about the disciplinary record because that might be relevant in terms of, um, you know, for example, if they were scoring a, a redundancy exercise or um, if they were uh, dealing with a, 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 a subsequent disciplinary matter and, and there was a live warning. Grievances, uh, that may, may be something that they wouldn't necessarily have access to. Uh, Emily, don't know if you've got any thoughts of that. Yes, I think it, it depends on on um, why they're wanting to view it, um, and so I think you've got to be mindful of 
the personal nature of of the data um, so as Eleanor says there may well be circumstances in which it would be appropriate for the line manager to see for example disciplinary record um, but if there is um, a grievance if there's a grievance against the line manager then you would expect the line manager to have um, seen those aspects of it certainly that that relate to that line manager so they can answer as part of the investigation um, and it might well be there are some outcomes that the line manager needs to be aware of if it's you know a, a dispute between two people that, that then means that you, you're going to put some things in place to try to keep them um, you know in different areas of the school as far as possible for example um, yeah, and equally if the grievance isn't about the line uh, that person's line manager you would for most uh, grievance procedures that the first port of call is to raise the grievance to the line manager so they might have seen this in that context but I do think it's important to um, to look at why uh, or the reason for that line manager viewing either the grievance or the disciplinary record um, yeah, I don't think they should ordinarily be just kind of popping to have a look at the, the personnel record so I think we've got another question during lockdown how legal are personnel documents signed electronically such as outcome letter well certainly I've done electronic signatures on on disciplinary letters even before lockdown <laughs> so I don't know Emily yeah. do you want to comment on that no um, I, I agree I mean I think it, it, it's not that common that you would see an outcome letter well uh, I think it varies uh, sorry in terms of outcome letters whether you would see a wet ink signature or an electronic signature um, in terms of in, t in the employment tribunal um, it, it comes down to whether or not it's likely that the claimant is going to dispute mm -hmm. the um, accuracy of that document so for example um, if they say they never saw it and they're trying to argue that that has been created um, separately you know, just for the purposes of being able to disclose it to the tribunal I, I don't know that a, whether the signature has been done electronically or not um, essentially matters but I, I can see it coming up as a question about the, the veracity of that document for example uh, you know, they, I suppose they could try to argue that somebody else within the school has created it and it wasn't signed by the person that um, it looks to have been signed by uh, but for the vast majority of cases uh, whether or not it's been signed electronically or wet ink isn't going to come into question um, and actually I have to say in a lot of tribunal procedures uh, when we're going through disclosure uh, I do end up with lots of documents that don't even appear to have a signature on them uh, and that again isn't a problem provided there's no question about um, the veracity of that document you know whether or not it's been uh, created just so that it can be disclosed or whether it was actually done at the time Good. Okay, I think that's the end of the questions. Okay, so thank you everybody for your time. Yeah, thank you very much for listening to us. And goodbye. <laughs>